present. Yep. Yeah, I was having an issue getting online for some reason, but we're here. But you're with us now. Here we go. Yes, yes. In spirit. <laughs> Any adjustments to the agenda? Um, yep. We'll go without the timekeeper for now. We seem to do okay. Um, public comment. Is there anybody from the public that would like to comment tonight? <sighs> okay. Act to approve the minutes of Monday, January 25th, 2021. It was a full board regular meeting. I would make a motion to approve the minutes as a, as submitted. This is Don. Thanks, Don. Uh, seconded. That's not. All right. Thank you. Any discussion? <laughs> if no discussion, so moved. Thursday, February 4th. So moved. Okay. Seconded. All right. So moved and seconded. Any discussion on those minutes? All right. Hearing no discussion, so moved. We are on to reports to the board. Amy, you're up. Good evening, everyone. Um, so you have my report in hand, and um, we're in the thick of budget, as you all know. That's my favorite time of year. We've had some really... Uh, Strong, I think, informational meetings that have gone well and been well received based on feedback we've received. So I think we have a good template and outline um, for districts as we move forward with uh, budget informational meetings throughout the spring. Um, we're down to just one budget left, uh, one district left to approve a 21-22 budget at the board level, and that's Granville Hancock. And we're moving on, and Stacy, you will see what we hope is a final draft here coming up for your district. Um, and so I'm also really proud of the fact that we continue to um, project uh, slight uh, surpluses in most of our districts and at the SU level. Um, and that all other than one district so far that's approved their budget, we've been able to get expenditure budgets to drop um, from uh, fiscal year 2021 to 21 22. One of the things I'm keeping a really close eye on is our ESSER II uh, monies. They haven't announced how much we'll receive yet around COVID relief, uh, but we know that the focus will be on um, regression and how we're gonna ad address that through a recovery plan. We're still also waiting from the Agency of Education to give us details around what needs to be part of the recovery plan. Um, so we've started to identify some strategies that we plan to implement to address regression um, for next year and the year afterwards um, across the SU. And then that will be tied back to social, emotional, learning and support and um, core academics. Don. Jamie, what are the parameters are they using to define regression, if I could ask? Well, they're going to look at our universal assessment data at this point. But the other data points they're looking at is attendance. Um, and they're, they're looking at other social emotional data points beyond attendance, like office discipline referrals, things of that nature. So those are some of the data points we're going to have to provide and then say, what are our strategies to, ad to address things like truancy? You know, our district's been in person for the most part, since last right. se September 8th. Uh, there was an interesting op-ed from Secretary French today that indicated only 50% of elementary schools are even back to offering full in-person learning at this point across the state. And it's about 20% that are offering full in-person learning at middle and high school level. So I think that you know what other districts are seeing is significant issues around social emotional health and truancy. Um, as as an effect of that, the I'd be ha I'm happy to let you know. Um, and Don, you know, Ryan Hack reached out to us um, from Sharon. He's on the Sharon Energy Con Conservation Group, 
and Ray could tell you the mouthful of what that group actually, what their title is. Do you remember, Ray? No. I, I don't, Jim. It was a long title. But they, there's uh, many of you now in your towns across the SU have different energy conservation groups that are addressing energy usage. And so they've hired a full-time person to support the towns across the SU, most of them. And they're interested in that person providing support um, for the schools. And so one of the things I wanted you to think about between now and next month is whether or not the SU would be interested in an energy committee that would be made up of some board members, interested community members like Ryan, faculty, staff, and I think students. This is a real opportunity to engage students in this work um, to work on a plan around things like um, solar, how to be more efficient in our usage, and um, then they could propose a plan to the board around a, how best tackle that and maybe provide some options. So I was interested in, in just gauging your guys' thoughts on that and whether or not we might want to address that next month around appointing a committee. Um, and then finally, I've invited, um, I'm proud of the fact that, you know, one of the things Secretary French addressed in his policy statements to superintendents this spring was the idea of supervisory unions sharing resources and uh, specifically in backroom resources. And so we have been engaging some informally around um, the Central Vermont Supervisory Union Fiscal Office, supporting um, Tara and myself around all things um, fiscal management, specifically around the revenue side of the budget. That's an area, if you look in the audit that we've struggled with in the past, um, and part of what has you know run us into our deficits often was on the revenue side, not just on the expenditure side. And so Chris Lacarno is here tonight. He's their chief financial officer. The executive board of the SU uh, voted um, to enter into an MOU with CVSU. And I mentioned this in my board report that would allow for us to receive fiscal services and support. And the trade-off is that we will lend them Ray Ballou to do some technology um, support. And this is more higher level strategic planning, running uh, problems by each other. And um, it's certainly technology is a strength of our supervisory union. So it made a sense of doing some trade off there. And um, we've capped that time at no more than 25 hours a month um, on average. And the MOU can be um, an agreed upon mutual consent around um, us no longer having the MOU in place with a 60 day notice. So the executive board did approve that. Um, and we're excited about that. So Chris is here tonight. Chris, if you just want to give a little wave so people can see who you are. And uh, Chris has been working behind the scenes on our revenue sides of the budget with Tara um, this current year. And so I appreciate all the, all the volunteering Chris has been giving us. Um, and there's no money trading hands across the SUs. Um, it's just trading of resources. So um, it spoke to what Secretary French was hoping to see take place. And they said they may actually provide some type of incentive for SUs to do this type of work. So I'm always hoping that maybe they'll support us too financially um, to pursue these types of opportunities. So Chris is here tonight and um, he's just sort of taking it in. I wanted you to be able to put a face to a name. Um, and when we talk food service, he has experience around food service for um, quite a few years. Chris, how many years you've been there now? Uh, 21. 21 years, yeah. And so he oh, oversees. But it's 21. Um, and uh, so, in case there's questions about how does the funding work if we were to set up an enterprise fund within the SU. Him and Tara have been talking about that, but he can certainly help you guys answer those questions as well. And then I'll take any other questions or thoughts folks may have. Can I just see, some of you have your cameras off, just thumbs up if the idea of an SU-wide energy committee makes any sense and whether we might wanna pursue that. Okay, so I'll try to formalize that some more and have an idea to you for next month around that. Sarah and Meg, you're good. 
I'm not really excited about it. Not in that okay. I don't think it's a good idea, but I don't have any more time to put into more committees. So yeah. don't look for me to volunteer for it. Yeah, and I think the makeup could be just even at the SU level, it's just a couple board members who are interested. I don't know if every district needs to be represented necessarily, because I think there's other stakeholders across each district that might be interested. Yeah, just, just to pipe in quickly, I feel like when we've had conversations around energy, um, some of us are more versed in that than not, and it would be great to just have a committee of people who kind of speak that language a little bit, representing all of us um, or thinking it through for us. Yeah, but you're right, Sarah. I don't think I would volunteer for another committee either if I value my family at all, which I do. <laughs> and my thought about this was we've sort of, um, we've talked about it, but I really need a group to create action on it. Do you know what I mean? The plan. And like all of you, it's it's sort of, it's been going down the list of priorities. And that's not because we don't think it's important. There's just been other work to do. So the idea is we really need a champion for this work of energy across the SU that can really get to work on it. That would be my thoughts around it. Nice. All right. Mika? I wanted to go back to the um, um, observations related to regression. And uh, I, I think I um, How long are you going to follow the potential effects of the pandemic um, in terms of you know, student performance and uh, and problems. How, you know, you just this year until everything's normal again, or, or is it going to be an ongoing, uh, you know, an ongoing kind of uh, review? Of so I think part of the regression plan, Mika, is going to require what is the data management process that we're going to use to measure it over time. My concern is not the immediate or next year, I'm really concerned that we still have some students, specifically at the primary grades, that have not been in our buildings for a year now, almost, right, because of VLA. And so what we're finding is our teachers are working incredibly hard in the virtual learning academy, but the growth of students and outcomes of students is really aligned to the support that happens at home is what we're finding. So if we have families engaged to help support the virtual learning that's happening, um, even though there are real life teachers, that it the outcomes are different. And we are measuring those data and we're gonna share that data with you at the SU level and at the district level. I thought it was important for you to get a snapshot of what is data looked at like virtually, where our students just attending virtually versus also the students in person. And so you see those data points merged and also separated in your reports next month. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, anything else for Jamie? Yeah, uh, this is Don. And so Jamie, on that last conversation, do, do I understand then that you can drill down to differentiate um, the regression patterns for people in the seat as well as people from doing homeschooling and things like that? I can't do homeschooling. I can just do virtual learning. So the students who have disenrolled and went to homeschooling, I have no access to their data. Certainly when they choose but, to come back, we'll do an assessment on them and a probe. So homeschooling isn't required to do those same assessments, is that? Okay. They have their own benchmark assessments that the AOE asked them to produce. But okay. no, I have no way to track them. Okay. Thank you. Jamie, has Secretary French uh, discussed reintegration of homeschool students and what that's going to look like in terms of making sure everyone's on the same page? I'm just wondering, like, how long, how far out we project there's going to be this kind of regress regression catch-up period and what that looks like, if anybody's thought about that yet. Well, I don't know if it's going to be a component of the recovery plan. I'm still awaiting guidance of what they wanna see in the recovery plan. I think we all are. I do know that the ESSER two money for this, that's gonna support this work is supposed to be across two fiscal years. So my sense is they at least have identified it's gonna take a couple fiscal years to address it. Um, what, we, uh, what we await is, is exactly how much are, is awarded to us and how can we use those funds. 
which is tough because you know it's already it's it is already march 1st and i'm already like all my planning now is for summer and fall right like that's where my focus is so it would be really helpful for us in regards to our planning to be able to identify what funds we'll have and how they can be used because then we could start really strategically making certain we're using those funds appropriately and not being reactive to it. All right, anybody else? If not, we'll move on to curriculum and instruction. Good evening, everybody. Um, I just wanted to speak uh, especially to the last question because part of what um, helps support those kids that will be uh, reintegrating are the strong and effective systems that we're trying to establish within the MTSS. So one of those things um, that I wanted to speak to this evening is just that we just concluded our um, assessment window for January. So I'll be having uh, detailed reports next month uh, in regards to how students have progressed uh, since they came back last fall. Um, in addition to that, I've been trying to build uh, principal capacity in um, working with a few um, kind of more intentionally around their data processes and um, how they're interacting to come up with plans and set goals for students um, as we are working very hard to close gaps. Um, I'm really looking forward to sharing with you um, more in detail, as I mentioned, about um, the progress of students and have done a, kind of a deeper dive into our STAR 360 data to kind of see how things have progressed over the last few years. Um, and then the final thing that I've been really focused on is um, starting to work with a group from the high school to try to develop um, a intervention uh, system to try to address some lagging skills that um, teachers and our assessments are picking up on. And we're trying to tailor make that um, sort of for the student profiles that we're seeing in grades nine and 10. So I'm really excited for us to pull together some proactive strategies in that area. Are there any questions regarding my report? All right, thank you, Amy. Thank you. Um, director of tech, uh, nope, special services director. Don? Hello, how is everybody tonight? Um, you have your, my report. I wanted to inform folks that we are pursuing to, uh, to try to hire a school psychologist. Um, I gave you some data. Is there any question on that data before I walk through it a little bit? Don, I'm going to ask that you hold off on your data report into the discussion area, if that's okay. Okay. So anyway, the report opens up as uh, what our intentions are uh, to try to hire our own school psychologists instead of uh, contracting out. Uh, I gave a little history of the child count of December 1st and some of uh, the disability categories and some of the numbers uh, represented in those categories. Um, an overall population um, and how many students are currently being serviced through special education. And it's about a 25% um, overall um, population. Uh, breaking down staff um, in the end, or I'm sorry, uh, placements, uh, where our students are, uh, what programs, uh, and then how are we supporting those folks uh, the special ed, speech and language pathologists, early ed, occupational and paraeducators. Any, any questions? So at, in my closing uh, on the evaluations, you know, we average about 90 a year. And currently we're about, um, you know, a little over $100,000 in evaluations, so fees. And if we bring somebody on board, if we can or locate somebody, uh, we would hire them under a teacher contract, so it wouldn't be close to a hundred thousand. Uh, Don, um, is the school psychologist going to be just uh, special education? Going to be no. hired? Going to be no, hired? With special education funds or? 
Yeah, but there's a 20% rule. So, you know, we can certainly uh, utilize the, that person's skills to help uh, principals and so forth in 504 and EST plan, uh, plan kids. Uh, we certainly would, uh, if there's a crisis situation, uh, bring that person in to support um, our community. Uh, with the so, number of evaluations that that person has to do, do you see that actually going to be time to do that? Well, um, maybe not, but we would put a big dent into that, uh, you know, um, overall, we would encourage that 90, 90 evals a year. Uh, having said that, we'll probably have to farm out some of those and specifically some uh, more involved uh, evaluation such as a might be an uh, you know kid who we're looking at for the autism spectrum or um, other really complicated cases. I just wonder with the amount of time it takes to do an evaluation, if uh, that person's going to have any time at all to help with counseling of regular education kids. Yeah, I don't see this position as a uh, you know quote therapeutic counseling. Uh, position. I see it just strictly evaluations and when, uh, you know, if there's a crisis uh, situation in our buildings, then that we would, we would support that person to help out the, the schools. Uh, Don, this is Tucker, do you anticipate this being a, a one FTE or a partial FTE? Uh, one FTE. Okay, thanks. All right, any other questions of Don? Okay, Director of Technology and Communications. Good evening. Um, hey, you Ray. have my report, I'm trying to bring it up here. I would like to say hi to Chris and uh, from CVSU and uh, hope that he found the first thing that I worked on for CVSU to be of value. And from my report, I want to highlight that uh, assessments are scheduled to start next month. SBAC and VTSA, we do not have a final answer on that. Um, but uh, at the moment, we're still planning for that to go forward. And then uh, a, a lot of what's in my report is uh, relates to PEBT. And uh, we've had a couple of schools um, go through, I reviewed what they sent back. Uh, they were confirming notes that we had. And preliminarily, it's, it's possible that the total value of the benefits here are $170,000 across the SU across 2021. So it's not, it's not a small amount of money. And, uh, and finally, we've had a, a lot of meetings in the past year. And uh, I would be happy to entertain any questions. Um, this is Stacy. I just wanted to note that um, of those 200 meetings, I think Ray participated in just about every one of them. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Ray. <laughs> uh, I echo, thank you, Ray. Uh, the work is its own reward. That's how I say that. Uh, and to be perfectly honest, I've learned a lot. Uh, that I never would have known before because I never attended uh, the meetings really. So thank you. All right. Anything else from Ray guys? Okay. Tara, business manager report. Good evening, everyone. So you have my report that was sent out with your other reports. I'll just provide a few updates. I sent to the SU board earlier today, draft three, final draft of the SU audit. The only change from that draft in comparison to the one that Jamie had sent to you back in January is that this draft actually has the assessments out to the member districts in it. So you'll see that the deficit for the SU has been wiped from the page. I think it was 19 on the PDF if you look at that. Other than that, we have received first draft audits on all districts, and we are on second and third drafts on several of them, and they should all be wrapped up by the end of next week. 
And as we get the final drafts in, I'll be sending them out to each of the boards for your review. And then any questions that you have, we can get together or you can ask me at your board meetings, whichever works easiest for you all. I provided the March due date updates for you. And then I just wanna give a huge shout out to Ray for all the work that he and Bill had both done on the PBET data collections and getting the information that we need and attending all of the meetings and getting all of that together and working with our food service managers to try and make that process as smooth as possible without a lot of guidance from the Agency of Education because they haven't received a lot of guidance from uh, DCF. So they made a lot of assumptions and got some really good materials together for us to be able to respond to the submission request when we actually get it. So they've done a great job. And then otherwise, um, I gave an update as to the CARES funding. Jamie touched on what the expectations are that we're gonna be able to use the ESSER two funds for. So that's in there. And then the discussion items that I wanted to go over with you on my revenue and expenditure report, I added a column on both the revenue and expenditure pages based on some board member feedback that it would be nice to be able to see what was in the report last month versus what I changed this month. So you'll see that is now part of the report. As far as changes are concerned for this month, I just updated the revenue and expenditures for COVID cost at the SU level. And then Don and Tracy have been working diligently with Butler's Bus Service on the special education transportation. And it looks like we're gonna have about a $14,000 savings there. So we put that into the expected expenditure savings. And then uh, solar presentations. I know we all have seen the Encore Renewable presentation when Jessica presented at the SU level and at each of the board levels. And then we had received a request from Green Lantern that they would like to be able to provide a presentation to all of the member districts who are interested. So if this is something you all want to do, if you wanna table it, if this energy committee kicks off, then perhaps we can put that in the hands as one of their projects. But otherwise I just need some guidance and feedback from you all as to what you wanna do about the solar presentations. And then lastly, uh, Larry from Competitive Energy, who is who we do our fuel oil and propane purchasing through, uh, reached out to us to let us know, as you've all probably seen in the media, that uh, fuel oil prices and propane price prices have increased substantially. So we locked in on our contract for FY2122. Our fuel oil price will go up to $2.07 from $1.50 resulting in about an increase of 66,000 throughout the entire supervisory union. And then propane will go from $1.249 to $1.549 resulting in about a $3,600 increase based on the current usage that we have. So those are my updates. And I'll entertain any questions that you have. I'd just like to say, Tara, I think we should push off the the energy stuff to the energy committee. It seems to be a suitable place there would be my my suggestion on that. Anyone else? Uh, I agree with that, Kathy. I think it's specialized. Um, information and I would love to have the committee take that on. Agreed. Yeah, I, I agree with that as well. I think it makes good sense if we're going to form a committee to have them start with something, you know, meaningful to jump in with. All right, so can I get a thumbs up that everybody's okay with that? Okay. You have a direction then, Tara. <laughs> Thank you all. Okay. Um, policy committee. Um, we just met before, prior to this meeting. Um, you'll see the policies attached to today with your documents. Um, it's just for a first look. It's going to go out to the boards, each individual board. Um, we'll gain some feedback there. Any questions? 
Anything else the committee wants to add? I'm not on the committee, but I had a suggestion in the policy scope, or uh, yeah, part two policy scope of, um, is there a reason why uh, school directors, uh, school board people are not in that, named in that? I mean, it says, and others or something, in, uh, but not limited to, but <clears throat> I thought that we should be held to this too. Well, that'll be something good to bring back and talk about at the committee. I think we touched on it, but I, I think we should circle back to that. Yeah, so um, this is Mika. Um, I'm on the policy board and um, I ask a lot of dumb questions. Um, and one of them was, you know, exactly how do we bring this feedback, uh, you know, discuss it and bring the feedback back. And we, it was, I was reminded that we are still very much in the draft form. So, well, Jamie's gonna help us compile, um, you know, uh, all the individual comments. We don't have to act as a board at this point to um, pass this or anything like that. Um, we're gonna, you know, really have an open discussion and try to bring back as you know, all the comments that we get from our individual boards uh, so that we can have a really full um, discussion about possible changes and revisions to this policy. Um, as you can imagine, it's really important that we have something that um, we can all really support. And the policy committee knows that I, I think that the, the board is where we should really start with a lot of this. So we should be trained and held to account as everyone else is. So another question that, I don't know if it's a question, but as I was reading it through and, and um, it, so it, it's very much anti-racism and, and it just kept popping into my head. What about all the other isms in our world? Are they, are, do you see where these are, they, are they covered in this policy? And we're, we're gonna try to, um... Uh, and other members of the policy committee, please chime in. But but um, we wanted to, because, for example, with um, a crime legislation, a lot of times it becomes unenforceable because it's so broad. We really want to focus on anti-racism, both for that reason and also because there are statutes now that require us to have anti-racist policies and uh, curriculum specifically. Um, and the idea is to get this one done and passed and then to um, reinvigorate our equity and diversity policies as well, um, very much mirroring this. Right. Thank you. Yeah, yeah this is Don. Yeah, sorry. With, this originally started out as an equity policy and got uh, uh, um, formulated into the anti-race. All right, guys. So this was just on here for, for discussion, bring it back to your boards, discuss it with them, and then come back. The, then their, the committee member will come back to the committee with the feedback. All right, so we are on to discussion items. Um, special education data report. Don, did you have some more you wanted to add? You gave a lot of additional numbers that we didn't hit on prior in your report. That's what I was indicating earlier. I know I, you took probably a, I probably you already probably gave gave them the punchline, but yeah. Well, the 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 numbers that were provided to me by Missy Burbine, who uh, organizes all our evaluations and and schedules everything, she pulled it together for me. It's for your just for your information, just so you can see the the scope of what we what we do in the district for evaluations, um, and it kind of you know pinpoints the different schools as well as um, what what you what you see over the last three years. And I'll just add, I mean, part of the goal is as we get better at um, within our in our, our multi-tiered system of supports, the idea is if we're really investing in early intervention, we should continue to see the need for comprehensive evaluations to decrease. When we talk about 25% of our students' population needing to be serviced via an IEP, you know, most, most research says that three to most 5% of our students have a specific learning disability. And so what I would say is, is that our inability to intervene quickly and swiftly sometimes has created the gap 
that then results in a special education evaluation um, in order to, to service the students because teams of teachers are at a loss of how do we best support the, the student. And so what we're looking to try to do is better, um, better train up and provide PD for our teachers so they feel like they have the tools needed to meet our students' needs, but also make certain we have interventionists that can intervene early and quickly. Um, so at a targeted level, so it doesn't necessarily have to result in a student getting two to three grade levels behind before we intervene. And so that's, that's part of what, you know, when we're talking MTSS, this is a piece of it, um, is how do we better address intervention earlier and add an, add, add a, and implement with fidelity. Right now, one of the things Don and I have been looking at is a lot of our intervention still is only implemented sometimes two or three days a week. And we know research says a minimum of four times a week for 30 minutes to try to intervene and gap and gap fill. And so one of the things we're looking at and what I've been talking to with principals and with Don about is we have to make certain we have staffing implemented in a way within schedules to intervene with fidelity. This idea of we, we provide intervention once a week, that, that just, you know, just to say we intervene, well, that's not intervening. That's not good enough. We can do better. And we have the resources to do better. And so we're looking at how do we better deploy our resources to make certain our students are getting intervention with fidelity. Don? Yes. Um, I'd like to thank you. Uh, this is the first time I've seen since I've been on the board, the total student population uh, and uh, total student special education population um of the district and i've asked for it i asked for it before um actually before you got on the board before you became the director and um have you do you know what the cost per pupil is for special education have you, uh, divided, have you divided that out not no but i can i can get that to you bob i'm just i'm just interested I, yeah, and I just just want to piggyback on what Jamie had said too about uh, implementing this with fidelity. And you know, as a in, this is for a, another meeting because I don't have all my the information. But the state is going to move away from that adverse effect uh, uh, to qualify kids in specific learning disabilities. So it's we've got to really um, shore up our MTSS uh, because it, that's how we're going to prove. Uh, for lack of a better word, adverse effect is if they're not, students are not able to progress with that tier two in intervention. Sorry, um, Don, you're using some terms that I don't quite understand. Adverse effect and... Uh... Yeah, uh, even uh, there's, in special ed world, we have, th we call them three gates. The first gate, we suspect a kid might have, a, or a child might have a disability. And so we, we hire a school psychologist um, to do an evaluation to determine if there's a disability. Uh, the second gate is adverse effect. How does that disability adversely affect that child's academic performance in one or more of the basic skill areas? And so we gather data. We have to have uh, prove at least three out of six criteria to see if that that specific or that disability has an adverse effect in one basic skill area or more. Uh, the third gate is need. So if the need is to provide specialized instruction uh, because you cannot provide that in the uh, school's comprehensive system of educational support. So all three of those gates need to be in the, in the affirmative, yes. Uh, to, to qualify. So the adverse effect is really looking at a basic skill and it could re it could affect a related service too, such as speech and language, OT um, and others. Is is there a graphic of that somewhere? Yeah, that I can pull it together down. for you. I yep. would love, I would just love to have that as a reminder whenever I'm looking at the SPED budget yep. of exactly what you do. <laughs> I mean, I know, I, I, as I said, I was a special education poster child in my time, but 
I didn't really know what they were doing to me. Um, but uh, yeah. uh, I, I'd love to see that. Thank you. Um, I have a I have a pretty detailed uh, flow chart that you I'll start with, and then if you have more questions, uh, I can put some more meat on that skeleton. Yeah, not not too much. It's nice to you know a page or yeah. two at most just to give me that that thing and reminds me exactly what we're doing here. Sure. Thank you. Um, along those lines, Don, um, I, I am with Ethan. I don't uh, understand this area of it all too well. Um, I would love to understand it better. Um, you do a great job explaining it. It's just that it's completely beyond my bailiwick. Um, but I did want to know, especially, I, I, I guess looking at this data, what are the goals? Is it to move away from, so is it to move more kids out of this need? Is it to, like, is there an objective that we can measure some level of success of the MTSS using the same data schema? Yeah, I think so. I think that what our goal is, if we should keep, you know, and that's the, it's the push through the, 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 the state as well, is to shore up our MTSS so that we, we, you know, and the funding source too is going to change, uh, so that we are able to, um, you know, you know, focus on more kids and not necessarily the disability. And as Jamie is a a, a big um, advocate, is like we don't want to identify kids by their disability, and so we want to help kids and support them. And I think with the with the funding formula changing eventually, and uh, this adverse effect, we're going to be able to work. Uh, you know, kind of uh, meld regular ed and special ed at some point. Uh, so we, we we can work with all kids. Thank we want to see our, we want to see our numbers get, go down. Uh, how, but you know, we all, we know that there's going to be children that will, will have disabilities, and we're going to have to serve them. Great, thanks for that, Jamie. I have a, I have a question. Um, this I've. You've talked about this multiple support system. Um, and basically, I think, does it start with an EST team? That is part of it, Bob, absolutely. So part it's the EST process. So the idea is high quality universal instruction, have means to track data, right? Like over time. And then teams of teachers, Bob, are meeting to say, this student is still struggling in reading. Well, what about reading are they actually struggling in? So as we, we become more proficient at analyzing data, we need to say, well, are they actually struggling to encode like chunk words or do they have an issue with comprehension? And then that team of teachers is gonna make a recommendation for intervention. Like it could be level literacy intervention, which you've all heard um, Amy Toff talk about, or it could be Orton Gillingham which is going to focus on phonics, right? And decoding and encoding words. So that team makes a recommendation and then we intervene with the interventionists and then we progress monitor that student a minimum of every six weeks to see, are they gaining? And one of the things we talk a lot about is rate of growth. They, they, they have to grow more than an expected rate in order to close the gap. In education, often we would say, all right, this student's been getting intervention. They grew three months this year. Well, that's great. They grew last year, they didn't grow any. Well, they grew three months, but we've been in school 10. So we just lost another seven, right? And so that, Bob, is what, that's the next step to this system is us starting to really look at our data by individual student, right? Not like let's compare percentages of, achievement, like let's measure individual students and make certain that they're all growing a full year's worth of growth. But we break it down around every three months. Did they grow a full three months worth of growth? No, then we just gotta ask ourselves why? And what, what, what can we do differently to ensure that the student's growing at that rate? And if they're not growing and we're providing intervention like Don said with Fidelity, then we gotta say, what information do we need that we don't have? And that's where doing more evaluation and probing with someone like a school psychologist would be helpful because we may be focusing on reading and really the student has an issue with working memory, right? Around executive functioning. And so we should be saying, what's the intervention we need to do to address working memory? 
not just continuing the same reading intervention and not seeing any growth with it. I want the board to, you under, does the board know what an EST team is? Educational support team. And you have a referral process for kids getting to that team? Yeah, and the process has changed such now, Don, um, Bob, that I saw with Don's hand raised, um, that we, we meet in those teams at each grade level cluster biweekly. And we're analyzing data points. So you're not waiting a month to get on an agenda. We're looking at our students every two weeks. Are you seeing progress? Yeah, and I think you're going to see it in our in our data reports. We've been able to close some regression. Um, do we have a ways to go? Absolutely. But teachers are working incredibly hard. And, you know, part of what we had to create this year was that structure to even meet. We didn't have it with fidelity in each building. Uh, and so we focused this year on building the structure and really making certain the language that you're all asking questions about, all the educators were using the same language. So that we all, when we all said something, we understood what it meant. All right. Anything else? Don, did you still have Wait. a question? I'm sorry. Yeah, no, Andrew. No. Andrew's hand was up too. Oh, okay. Go ahead, and um, um, Yeah, I think I, you answered some of this, Jamie. But I was kind of like, I, I think it's great to see kind of the scope of what the special education system is, um, but. You know, this doesn't really give us a good feel of how we're doing with it. You know, once kids are in the special education system, I, from what Jamie's saying, it sounds like we'll be able to look at student results data and um, that would definitely be helpful. I was just thinking of other data things that we could look at. Like, you know, I think with some special education students, they have disabilities that are going to, you know, require them to get support, you know, like it's not going to necessarily show up in academic performance and stuff. So one other thing I was thinking of was like, if we could have parent um, or family evaluations to see how they feel like if they're being supported enough, um, things along that nature. Um, Those assessments are done annually, correct, Don? The AOE does. The AOE does require, sends out something to parents, uh, and I'm not sure when they do that. But if there's a survey to parents that say, "How's your district treating your kid, and how and how's the educational support are being provided uh, through special ed?" So there, there is a there is a, um, that, a and that's survey. A, that's that's a yeah that would be good done for us to share some of those results. There's nothing yeah. confidential in there, so. We'll look to share that with you on an upcoming agenda. I'm going to add it as a future agenda item. And Andrew, one of the things I have asked Amy to do um, is that we're going to break out and start doing a better job tracking different um, cohorts of students. And one of them is students served via IEPs. And what is that population's rate of growth? Um, and one of the things we've struggled with is a data management system that does that as effectively and as efficiently as it should. We've been using Otis here for a number of years. I don't know if you guys have heard of Otis, but as Ray, Amy, and I continue to dig into the data sets, it's certainly not meeting our needs. And so one of the things is we bring on a chief academic officer that we need to look at is, is the current data management system we're using, Otis, capable of answering those questions you just posed? Because right now we're like still counting students by hand. That's not efficient, nor what we should be paying administrators to do. Right? There's got to be a better way. And so that's one of the things we're looking into. Okay. So is the idea that there's going to be kind of this special education assessment built into some of these other reports that we'll see down the line, or are we going to, like, yep. it seemed like we were targeting this month for looking at special education data. Well, it, so, yeah, so we gave you this part. Next month, you should be able to see how they performed, Andrew. That data was still coming in. So you'll get it when we show the rest of the SU-wide data. Thanks. Don Shaw, did you have something? Yeah, I wanted to know, what's the 504 population? 
Don could tell you that, but maybe not off the top of his head. I know we know it. You know, one time I counted 90 kids in the district. I'm not sure if that's still accurate or not. And I don't know, uh, and this is my just my perspective, is that I think we're, we're over-identifying kiddos on 504 that really could be serviced better on an uh, EST team. Who's do, do we have a 504 coordinator? No, Bob. That's handled at each district level. Specifically, most of the time, it's either a, it's assigned to like your MTSS folks, right? Like at Rudd, you have two MTSS folks that oversee those. Um, Sharon District has an MTSS person's a point two that oversees some of those plans and that work like that. At FBUD. It's their student support specialists. It's a little different depending on the district. At our set, it's the school counselor, and at Stratford, it's the school counselor. Yeah. Can I just add something to what I said there? We're over identifying. Uh, we know that the the kids, uh, students who have disabilities, who, and for example, might have been on an IEP and they had their three year reevaluation and they were determined ineligible for um, specialized instruction through an IEP. Uh, and what I think the uh, philosophy was that, well, they have a disability, we'll put them on a 504 plan. How it should work is that you need to consider a 504 plan and have that, that uh, conversation. Uh, but the team, the 504 team, has to prove how that substantially limits one or more of the basic life activities. Um, and, and again, substantially is subjective. Uh, but that conversation has to has to occur, and I, and I'm not sure if it it's been consistently considered that way in the district. Um, okay. Who, who, who checks on the case managers and to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing on a 504? Principal by statute, that's in their job. Ah. Principal is the coordinator of 504s by statute. Are they doing they're it? Possible legally, absolutely. Much better than we were. Right. Um, does, that I mean, think so does that mean you're doing it, Daniel? Yes. Yeah, they're involved in the data teams now. I mean, they're they're actively looking at their students' data and involved in those data teams. So I, I'm I am pretty confident that they they're much better aware. Before, I don't even think it necessarily they understood that was part of their role or responsibility. So I think they're becoming much more proficient at that. <clears throat> if there's 90 kids, 90, 90 kids to case manage, I'm just curious to know if the principals are aware of every individual kid on a 504 plan. Well, I would ask you to ask your principals that. But I, I would say each district, the awareness is probably a little different. But I am confident that they are checking EST plans and that they're sitting at IEP meetings now and at 504 team meetings. And I know that because I'm copied on emails often with them around correspondence around those things. And Don is too. So prior to this, um, one of the changes we made around restructuring special ed is principals did not act as the LEA. And so what do I mean by that? They were not at the IEP team meetings in the administrative decision making um, position around how to how to best support students around funds that you all budget and so now we require an administrator to be the lea at all iep meetings and they're required to attend 504 meetings bob okay all right guys don are you sure you're good Um, all right. Anything else on this topic? If not, moving on to 1920 audit. So I'm just going to jump in. Not much has changed since I showed you this with you in January, other than like Tara said, we just, we did bill out the deficit and reassessed it to the districts. You can ask questions about this tonight. You can choose whether you're willing to approve this or not tonight. That's up to you. I plan to have this to you in your packet Friday, and we didn't get it for Friday. And so 
We gave it to you as soon as we received it. And so I'm totally cool with you waiting if that's what you want to do. Certainly, you know, if you look in the audit and I please do look in the audit, I would highlight one of the areas that we continue to address was tracking how we're using monies with our federal grant. And we've implemented periodic time studies. So in intervention is prior to this year. We're not completing regular time studies to show that the amount of time that they were budgeted to provide intervention aligned. And so now every two weeks, anyone who's paid for by the federal grant, excuse me, as part of their FTE has to submit daily schedules of when they're intervening and when they're not, because there's chunks of money built into the federal grant for positions across the SU. Then on a quarterly basis, the supervisory union office is analyzing these time studies to ensure that the FTE budgeted for the grant is going to be realized and received. And so that was an area that was noted in the audit that I wanted to speak to you about. Those, change, those procedures all changed effective July 1. But remember, this audit you're looking at is 1920. It wasn't 2021. And so you should not be seeing that next year. All right, questions about the audit? I, this is Don. I really haven't had a chance to look at it. We got it very recently, so I don't have any questions at this point. Um, Ethan here. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, um, Ethan. Just wondering how, uh, how they're treating us after the last meeting. How are the auditors treating us? Tara? They have been very responsive and working with Rose and I to make sure that everything that needs to be processed is getting processed timely so that we can get this finalized. So you're, you're feeling better than before? Our we audit, about, the team that we have right now in place for the audits, they're, they're doing a great job. Okay. Because we were about ready to fire them last month, and uh, I just wanted to see where we are um, now. We still want to fire them? Sometimes. <laughs> good okay all right but not yet good thank you all right guys any other questions the audit do we want to take this up tonight or do we want to push it to next month's meeting to approve i know don mentioned he hasn't had a chance to look at it and i haven't really had a chance so i haven't had, um I've, I've looked at it but i'd like some more time Next I month. did have a question real quick. Um, you know, my impression was that the overages were mainly the uh, in the special education side, but looking at the audit, I wasn't really able to see that. Um, it was pretty close, Andrew. It was actually almost a 50-50 split as far as what the deficit was at the end of the fiscal year. So when we did the allocations, it was really close as to what was the SU's deficit versus what was special education. Okay. All right. Um, I guess like it'd be good to have kind of a summary of what areas we went over on, you know, and uh, assessment of why that happened. I mean, some of it I, I kind of know about already. It seemed like half of it was kind of the financial office side, which we kind of knew about, but, um, that that's my only comment. I would agree with that. Like a bullet point sheet or something like that would be very handy as well as the numbers. Okay. Any other questions? So Jamie, it looks like we want to push it to approve at our next meeting. Yeah. And that's what I was going to recommend. So. Um, our, rec our next, this is Dawn, our next meeting, I guess, was scheduled as an executive board. So we can either amend it to uh, a full board or we could allow the executive board to approve it after each town has had their, their individual boards to ask questions. I mean, it's, we can do it either two different ways. Kathy, what do you think? Um. I think we should do it as a full board. 
Okay. Um, can we, should we change that meeting to a full board meeting? That's what I'd recommend. You're all pretty good about attending lately anyways, so. I think the virtual platform helps, right? With our full board attendance because yeah. it's, you're not driving. So that has been a real plus, I think. All right, so we're gonna change our next meeting, Jamie, and you can take care of that to a full board meeting and we'll have a plan on approving the audit that night, guys. So any questions and stuff you need to get answered that you don't think you can get answered that night, possibly send them to Tara or Jamie and get them, get them resolved so that we can make a decision that night get it approved okay um 7.3 future of wrnu food service hey good evening everyone Bill Montenuri here um, i'm the assistant director of one planet and also been working with our child nutrition folks for almost a year now so i guess to start off just hopefully you've had a chance to review uh our report and just wondered if anybody had any questions on that before we jumped into concerns and discussions about moving forward. And I can't see everybody on my screen here. So if you do have a question, please just speak up. Pop but, I can't see everybody either. So definitely speak up if you have a question tonight. Well, it sounds like they don't have questions. Bill, before you start, I just want to give the board a little. So what I'd like to do tonight under discussion is get a sense from you whether or not you would consider acting on one of our two proposals um, next month. And we'll get to you about what that is. And it's really stay status quo, which you don't have to act on, which we're going to advise you not to do, or consider moving food service personnel to the SU. And we're what we'll talk to you about is the why and then how that would work financially, okay? And what we think the benefits of that would be. And so that's the idea tonight. We're not asking you to take any action on this tonight, but sort of looking for you to say, Jamie, stop. This is like four meetings now. You've brought food service up or continue to talk to us about it because we understand that maybe we need to move in a different direction around it. Does that sound good? Not asking you to take any action tonight. Okay. Sorry, Bill. No, no, that's fine. Give her the direction, Jamie. Uh, I'm sure the board appreciates it. So I really just want to highlight some some concerns and sort of what we've discovered over the last, last year. Jamie and Tara and I have been talking uh, fairly regularly. We had a nice meeting on Friday afternoon with your child nutrition staff. I guess the, the first thing actually that I want to say is that we're all really proud and pleased of our, our child nutrition and nutrition services folks. These folks have been working really hard. They have been on site preparing meals, doing meal service in a totally new and a totally different way with a program they're not used to for almost a year now. And we just want to take some time and just take a moment to recognize their efforts, recognize the fact that these folks have been on site at their place of employment uh, for a year as we've worked through this pandemic. And we just we just want to make sure that the board is aware that these folks are doing new things, working really hard and looking for ways to make changes. These are good folks and just want you to know that they're working really hard for you and our kids out there. Summarize sort of our concerns. At this point, despite the increased oversight, despite what we're doing with, with compliance, the meetings and the conversations we're having with nutrition services, with the consulting we're doing across the state, we're still projecting deficits for all our programs at this point. We can't count on the soft monies to buoy those budgets. We have gotten some equipment grants which are gonna help with larger pur purchases. The big math part here, September through November, we were looking at $5.96 to produce a meal. At our highest reimbursement rate on the summer food service program, we are still $1.64 in the hole per meal per site. That, as you well know, can't continue to happen and project being in the black or even breaking even for nutrition services. What we are hoping for and what we're talking about and what we wanna look at is not only having 
the robust educational program and those goals were, were listed in the report. You were just talking about some of those goals that relates to, to Don and the special services department. We want to make sure we're pairing that with, with robust and quality nutrition services. What we've discovered at this point, if you don't choose to take any action, that's okay. Uh, we, you can certainly continue to operate quality local nutritional programs that are compliant and well-liked uh, by students. One of the concerns that by statute, it is supposed to be uh, consolidated, but the state hasn't been bothering us with that at this point. I do need you to understand that these operations will likely operate at a deficit going forward. Our concern around that as it relates to goals is that if we are constantly having to retire deficits and absorb that, it might be that we would have to look at the educational programming side of the budget to reduce costs, to cover those costs. The other option we have, and we've talked about, is moving the nutrition services crew underneath the SU. This would allow us to be more compliant with our audits. This would allow us to be more efficient in terms of paperwork, menus, ordering. It would, it would certainly save some money on ordering. It would also allow us to shift staff around. Uh, I also believe Jamie was talking about on Friday, there are a couple of folks at this point that fall underneath that umbrella that don't reap the benefit of, of the master agreement for support staff. They would then fall underneath that. And we would like to continue working to try to do the best uh, program we can for the best amount of money in the most sustainable way for you as we continue to look and evaluate um, what we should do going forward. Yes, Don. Uh, this is Don. Um, one of the things that I noticed was absent in the plan has anybody explored the opportunity to campus the community and getting people signed up for the free and reduced lunches? That would allow us to get more reimbursement under federal money, which would help bring in some revenue. I, I, yeah. I don't know if that's been looked at or not. Don, we yeah. did a second push for free and reduced applications in April. So our hope is one of the, the recommendations when I went through the first summer food service training um, when I first came on board, several of the food service directors in the child nutrition program had talked about the electronic free and reduced application and how that takes away that stigma that, you know, I'm going to be giving my financial information to someone that I see every day. So one of the things okay. that I'm hoping that we're able to be successful with in this next fiscal year is to actually move to that electronic application in hopes that it will also get some increased um, participation on that application. And then it would be done centralized and kind of take that, that stigma away from it. But we did see a few come in, but we still have pretty low participation in it. Right. I, I would suspect that if we were to reach 100% saturation point, we would see a substantial increase in federal monies coming in. I mean, that, that's another way to offset costs. So It is. The issue is right now, we are 100% free, and we're re being reimbursed at a higher rate mm -hmm. than the regular child nutrition program, and we're mm -hmm. still projecting a deficit. Wow. So that's the reality of this. I mean, the, you know, to be, you know, I like to be pretty frank. We are, we are really at a, at a breaking point of sustainability with food service at the point of, if we do nothing, you're looking at across the SU, a reduction of four enforced around four full-time FTE a year per year to offset the deficit. Because when you look at the food service, de food service deficit across the supervisory unit as a whole, it's over 300000 a year when you add up what you've been running for deficits. And so that's my major concern. And so I use it as FTE because essentially as we're up against the threshold in a lot of your districts, as you know, around um, per pupil spending, then we're going to have to look to offset costs somewhere. 
And there's no way for us to generate enough revenue right now in food service without decreasing our cost to make up the difference. Because every meal we sell right now, we lose a buck fifty on it. And that's at the higher rate of reimbursement. Our average per meal plate cost, I think this is a really important number. And Bill, thank you for doing it. It's on the last page. If you look just above five on B, the average per meal cost for us from September to November across the SU was $5.96 a plate. That means based on our reimbursement of everyone being free, we lost a buck sixty-four per meal. Um, question, Jeremy. Um, the, I, I hear it. I mean, I heard it the first time you mentioned it at um, at some of the other meetings. Uh, the biggest part for me is the selling this to our um, towns. Um, the idea that you know this. There's been a lot of concern. And of course, that's, you know, we're still rebuilding trust in the SU, people looking to the SU as something that's organized and looking out for them as opposed to something that's chaotic and unresponsive. And I'm just saying how, you know, if this is yet another thing that the SU has taken on, it makes sense to me, you know, if we're not doing it. And but 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 how do we sell this? I think one of the things we can talk about, Ethan, is that we can begin, and we've started this over the last year, the child nutrition team can just be that. They can work as a team. We can have people, and instead of having eight separate entities that are all creating menus, all creating production records, all doing ordering, all making adjustments, all trying to establish traditions and be programmatic, we can begin to think about this as a, as a team of people, as well as trying to put people that have different skill sets in more of a sweet spot so that we're not duplicating work as much. At this point, every almost every piece of paperwork and almost every function, other than some that I've taken on that that sort of go across the board, each one of your, your nutrition directors does the same thing every month in terms of their, their compliance and, and their preparation to do meal service. So one of the things we can do is if we need to move staff, if they're under an SU, we can do that. If we want to move toward an aligned budget, or it's not an aligned budget, excuse me, aligned ordering, aligned production records. In theory, we can have a team of one or two people creating menus, one person taking care of, of the ordering, which will make us more efficient. I'm not telling you here at this meeting, and I'm not saying and trying to say this, that we, we're going to do this and, and everything is going to be coming up roses. But this, this is, this is the stuff. No, it's we, worth it. We it's worth a it try. I guess yeah. here's, here's what I'd like is I'd like um, when I go to my, you know, our, our towns, I'd like an article. I'd like, I'd like it to be public knowledge. This facts that Damie just said, um, you know, that we're getting unreimbursed more than ever before. And we're still losing money on this. Some of the, some of the deficit numbers, that you all came up with that you gave us, I think it was six months ago or so. Uh, I just think some publicity would really help this issue. So it isn't just, oh, by the way, the SU is taking over one more part of something that's traditionally been, you know, a school thing and been well handled. Um, sure. So I, I, I just think publicity would really help to get this these numbers out there. Yeah. And if the board, you know, has has a list of items, you're you know, you're welcome to send them to, to me or, or Jamie or Tara and happy to get you that information. At this point, we probably have more data on nutrition services than we've probably had in about a decade. Uh, for those of you that are really interested in numbers, I can give folks uh, a lot of numbers. If people are concerned with the programmatic side and how it affects children, I'd be happy to talk with you about that. Uh, OK. Uh, I've got Lisa Floyd, and then we'll go to Andrew Jones. Hi, thank you, Bill, um, and thank you for presenting this information. Um, sure. I think that presenting things the way that you have tonight um, is really going to be helpful. I think that bringing to our communities this idea that we do have some challenges that we're facing um, in regards to this would be helpful. And I think that we need to do sort of a full on exploration of what our options are. 
um, and, and bring forward a lot of detail. I know that in many communities, there's a lot of emotion wrapped up in the food service, but I also know that, you know, I think it was the Abbey Group that submitted a proposal earlier in the merger process, and I know that it wasn't the time because there was so much that was changing. Um, but they will work with your with your staff, and they honor your your community values, and they buy Vermont foods and and support um, local nutrition. So. I'm just excited to start to know more about what our options are and to have data to look at. Thanks, Lisa. Andrew. So uh, when we were doing the merger in, from our Bethel and Royalton into um, a single district, you know, we kind of, when we were doing the budgeting for that, we were penciling, oh, we're going to be a larger entity, so we'll get, you know, 5% savings on blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I don't know how much of that actually um, materialized. So if there's any way that you can look at, like, the contracts that you have and actually, you know, say, with this, we'll be purchasing this amount and we'll get be eligible for this discount from this provider and have actual specifics on what money could be saved by going, that would definitely help sell things, like having actual concrete numbers as opposed to these, you know, assumptions that we're going to save money as a larger entity um sure oh sorry and, I thought you were done. oh yeah i have one other point um you know when we say that our we're losing money on every meal that we sell i feel like that's always been the case you know we've always had in our just speaking for our district like we've always had fifty three thousand dollars as a subsidy towards food service in our budget and the deficit that we've seen in our food service budget has been because we're you know, we haven't been budgeting enough as a subsidy towards that. And so it just winds up as a deficit or, you know, we're spending more than we expect to in food service. So um, I guess my question would be more like, how is this different than what we've had before where we're subsidizing from the main budget to the food service budget? Uh, to address your first question, Andrew, you do receive some bulk savings through RUD buying in bulk. I project if we bought as an SU and ordered as an SU, it, that would include all the breakfasts, all the lunches, all the after school snack that One Planet usually does, and the normal summer food service program that we usually run. That would get us savings. A, I'd have to check. I would guess Rudd is probably saving maybe maybe two and a half to three percent, depending on your purchasing. This would I project get us to six and a half to perhaps six point seven five, which is an additional savings over what any any of the districts um, have. And we're also hoping that a few of the efficiencies that we gain by working together and continuing to work together will will help us with that. Uh, if people are interested in specific budget numbers, what you're looking at you know, we can certainly share those, share those with you and, and those projections. I do want to mention just for those of you that, that like numbers and are interested in numbers, one of the things that's challenging and hard to do is you project your budget, project your numbers and your deficits. A lot of the system is very dynamic. Don brought it up. What is our free and reduced lunch percentage? What are food and supply commodities doing? What is our participation rate? And these are all questions we've we've been asking this year. What are our highest participation, lowest cost meals? And how do we do those? How do we think about using that information to offer a menu and make tweaks locally as necessary so that we can always have the highest participation we can, but the lowest cost? We've also talked a lot about at breakfast. I'm a big breakfast guy. I could always have, you know, two eggs, toast, you know, bacon, waffles. It's great. I love it. And the kids love it too. And that's one of the things we don't want to lose if there's any special traditions we have at any of our schools, which goes back to Ethan's point. We actually want to look to grow traditions, but we also want to be responsible and think about, okay, we could do a big breakfast if we're losing $3 or $4 every breakfast, even though the participation's high, we're really going in the hole. We're advocating for more of a grab and go sort of breakfast model at, at this point. Uh, again, Jamie, Tara, and I are not promising by pulling this underneath the SU that everything is going to be completely roses as far as, as the money goes. But 
it should allow us to at least put a budget together, look at a budget and, and help the child nutrition people look at those numbers and think about what they're doing and, and do a better job than what we're currently doing. That's, that's what I guess I would message to you. I think we can do a better job than what we're currently doing. Ethan. Um, i just follow up on that. Um, I, I, I I think it's worth, I think it's worth a try. I really think it's worth a try. I don't think we can hurt the one thing. And this is following up on what Lisa said uh, with the emotions involved. I think it needs to be really important that that doesn't come across as, you know, shaming the people who are at the food service at each, you know, school and saying, boy, you did a lousy job. Um, you know, this is, we're going to take over. Um, uh, I think it's, you know, the, the, and I'm hearing, I'm hearing integration, and teamwork and, and those terms. And it's just that the message has to be sold in a good way. And of course, um, uh, um, we will be looking after a year. I mean, the way it was presented to us at our last meeting was we were, um, uh, you know, you, this is a trial program, give it a look and come back with some numbers next year. And of course, if the numbers aren't any better, well then, you know, at least we, we've, we've done some assessment on it. Um, but I, I definitely think this is worth a try. It's just got to be handled carefully. Just so the board knows, Bill and Tara have been meeting with our food service folks regularly, and I met with them all on Friday. And the response I've received is that they're appreciative that, we're that one, we're talking about the problem, that we're trying to do it in a collaborative effort, and that they're actually getting real numbers now. Like I had a food service person director email me and say, this is the first year we've actually been given numbers so that we can analyze it to try to do business differently. And so that's really what we're trying to do here. And as far as, you know, selling it, I think that the one thing that we can say is, is that as an SU, we have taken great leaps in regards to coordination, our COVID-19 coordination we launched a elementary wide schedule that all schools implemented from day one and that our principals meet weekly now without any SU guidance to coordinate efforts to ensure that there's continuity around the system. So I think we're gaining in that department. And I think COVID-19 is a tangible one, Ethan, that folks could link into around the power of the SU wide approach around that one. I think another point that you could um, you could say to your your local board, Ethan, is that, and again, you you can continue to do things this the same way. What they shouldn't expect is to see different results. And I do think along your line of thinking, there's a chance here that we're we're hoping we're going to get get better results than than we are having. And then there's going to be the assessment part. Okay, are we are we pleased with this? How much better do we think we can do, or or do we need to need to think about, you know, something else? Stacy, go ahead. Um, I think you I, you mostly answered my question, but I did want to just reiterate that this, you know, that there is this um, kind of pervading attitude in many communities that you know they're losing local control, and I think this could easily be seen as one more of those things. Um, I've seen a few SUs do this and then complain that they're no longer allowed to use their school gardens for lunches and that their menus quality has deteriorated. And, and I would just, you know, I would just be really mindful that this is something that in many communities defines their identity. And you know, if we can offer something that has some flexibility, so you can have your own like noodle day if that's your thing or you can you know make sure that your garden is available for you to harvest from if that's part of your curriculum or if you have farm to table work but just make sure that there's some flexibility for people to maintain what you know what what they consider the last of their local control while we do this because i think ultimately money does speak and we see what's happening to budgets and if you tell people that this, there's a real cost savings here i think that we'll convince them but i don't want to do anything to take away from what's become really special about many of our communities so you know i think you again i think you've heard that and sorry to um beat a dead horse um but i just want to make sure that that's you know that's something that i see a lot of especially around this topic but i i think we've been discussing it for a while i would love to see something move forward to test the waters on this and just to just to reflect on what you said, Stacy. Programmatically, we are we are very interested and very concerned about your nutrition services staff. 
they are very concerned about where their positions stand or, or, or what could happen. Um, they are our employees and we're going to look to continue to take care of them. Programmatically, we want these programs to improve, meaning that if they have a really cool tradition in, in Stratford, we want to see if we can move those traditions to other schools. If they've got meals at Sharon that are just really, really doing well, really, really easy to, to prep, easy to order, low cost. I, I envision creating a system where we're offering menus that are the lowest cost, the highest interest we can. And, and I think the other thing is food is a social time and it's the kids time and we don't, we can't have, and this is another thing you can say to your boards, we can't have school without nutrition services. It's not 1980 in Riverdale, New Jersey, where, you know, somebody's serving me lunch and that's just the way it goes. These folks are professionals. They're doing a professional level service and they're doing this service so we can have school. The, the last time uh, we, we had uh, a weather day and we didn't have, uh, or we, we had uh, some COVID. Sorry, it wasn't weather, it was COVID. The state was emailing me at 8.30 in the morning about trying to get meals out because they're so concerned about that. Uh, please rest assured, one of the things, we're, we're not just looking at numbers, we are very interested in people, and we're very interested in the programmatic elements of this because uh, it, is, it is a program, and these folks are professionals. All right, thank you. Jamie, what do you need from us tonight? Sorry, Kathy, there are some hand raised. Oh, yeah. I can't Good see the hand raised on my uh, Go ahead, Don. I, I, Don has his hand raised. Okay. Um, I guess what I'm, hear, what I'm hearing generally is a, an agreement to look forward, but is there a way that you can theoretically put together a program that we can review rather than we'll all come together and then assess it in a year? I mean... I'm not quite sure I understand what you're asking me, Don. The, do, a, do a theoretical merger and show us with the figures where we're going to save money. Oh, yeah, right. I could I, I could show that to you right now. That that we, We've already done that work. I'm happy to share that. Uh, I do think that would be good just along with uh, what Andrew said. Any other any other questions or talking points uh, that that you want or that Ethan has has talked about that that you want for your your local boards happy to happy to do that and i can tell you quick reference based on the numbers that i have let's see can i find it maybe i can't find it i can find it so, for you so right i think second. the next step would be to go out to each of the individual boards and have this conversation um with that information yeah and don i'll bring that information with it with me yeah okay so i think that's what our next step is and see if we get buy-in from the individual boards and then we can make a decision. Does that sound right? Yeah. 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 That sounds fine. So if yeah, just share. Cost savings, it makes... What Don? If we, if we can show the a cost savings to our constituents, it, it's logical. It's a logical step. Yeah, but I agree. We can't promise it and then it not come through. All right, so yeah. Jamie, you'll start getting it out to the individual boards and we'll come back and discuss it at our next meeting. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. All right, um, super superintendent evaluation update. The committee has a meeting with um, the VSBA to go through the, the data um, that they provided back to us. So um, we'll keep you updated on that. Um, and we said we were going to audit. I, I sent the um, superintendent summary and a confidential email to the committee members, just so you know. So you'll have that for Wednesday night. Thank you. Next committee meeting. Thanks, Jamie. All right. The audit, we are pushing that to give everybody a chance to look at and hope for voting on next month. Um, so we're on to the interview of finalist for the WRVSU CAO of MTSS. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce um, 
Missandra Adams. And um, this process that we put forward was, um, there was a committee that was facilitated by Andrew Bowen and Ray Ballou. Uh, we had a committee that was made up of um, a student representative. We made certain that each district um, had a representative, either community or uh, faculty or staff um, that represented them. Uh, we had five candidates that were interviewed and um, the committee moved two uh, forward for me for an interview on Thursday. And then there was also an opportunity for teachers and staff across the SU. And we actually did have one parent and guardian. We had opened it up for them too, for a forum. And we collected feedback from those 45 minute interviews and introductions as well. And um, it's my pleasure to introduce you um, to Andra as your finalist. And so Dr. Adams um, is coming to us. She has uh, a degree, a doctorate in education um, from Harvard and has served as an assistant superintendent both in Washington State and at Cambridge Public Schools. And what, what I will say to you is, is that I was originally very interested in Andra's application, but then also said to myself, will Andra have the interpersonal skills necessary to leverage change within the supervisory union was my concern and connect with our constituents. What came through the interview process is, is that Andra has really strong interpersonal skills and that I could really see Andra um, being a teammate and join the WRVSU team and support the SU office, and more importantly, support our students through assisting and servicing our schools, teachers, staff, and principals. And so it's my pleasure to introduce you to Andra, and Andra is gonna introduce herself, give a little background around the why, and then it will be open for board uh, questions. Great. Good evening, Andra. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you for that introduction and uh, nice to meet you all virtually. Um, I guess this is the way that we do business currently. So it's um, it's good to see uh, so many faces to, tonight um, and get just have a chance to uh, tell you a little bit about myself. And then I'm um, excited to hear you know what questions you have for me. Uh, I think of myself as a longtime educator and, and leader who has worked, um, kind of spent my career working on equity in education across the, uh, the education sector. And that has, if you've you know, seen my resume, that has been in a, a number of different parts of the education sector, um, but really with that, that strong through line um, of thinking about um, particularly kids that are um, underserved or marginalized in different ways and thinking about how do we ensure that they have access to um, and uh, engage in an excellent education. And so that has really been uh, what has driven me uh, in the work that I've done, um, starting as a first and second grade teacher in Seattle, Washington is my, my kind of my first uh, steps into the, the formal education sector, um, but then working uh, globally um, both setting up sort of libraries in Guatemala to sort of helping uh, countries that are working on um, ensuring that their school systems um, were getting rebuilt after conflict, uh, countries that had left their girls out of education and helping them um, bring girls in. So a lot, again, the you know the different groups that have been left out of education. Um, and then most recently working in, um, in district leadership, as, as Jamie mentioned, both in Washington State um, and uh, in Massachusetts where uh, I am now. Um, and in, in those roles overseeing sort of the the teaching and learning side of the house, the curriculum and instruction um, with uh, anywhere between kind of 10 and 18 um, curriculum and program departments underneath me um, for the, the schools, 18 to 22 different schools um, in those districts. And a lot of the work that I did um, there was sort of revising our assessment system. So you've, you all have talked a lot about sort of assessment tonight and thinking about what information, what data do we need um, to ensure that we really know how kids are doing um, and making sure that our, we've got good data and data that um, can inform uh, good decisions, both at the you know, at the classroom level with students and teachers, um, but and families, principals, and all the way up. So I've done a lot of uh, work around that. I've done um, a lot around um, also revamping professional learning for adults. And so a lot of the discussions, uh, you know, we're, we're really focused on kids and what they need to do. But a lot of it um, is working with our you know adults and helping them. Uh, uh, improve their skills and their capacities uh, in a rapidly changing world, and uh, you all have experienced that a lot in, in the last year. How do you how do you suddenly teach very differently? Um, but especially 
um, I've talked a little bit about, you know, around the importance of culturally sustaining pedagogy and racial equity and um, and how do we support adults uh, in, in that in any number of uh, in scenarios. So um, that has been an important part of the work I've done as well as um, thinking about how do we, you know, update and revise curriculum so that it meets, you know, new standards um, and uh, make sure that uh, students are getting kind of a, a rigorous and joyful um, experience in in the in the classroom and so that's the that's the work that i've done uh in the last uh number of years and so i um was really this is a uh, we have been my family's been interested in uh in a in a re relocation to um to Vermont and particularly, uh, you know, central Vermont, Upper Valley and um, and have been just sort of looking at, you know, are there opportunities there that fit um, sort of my skills and passions. And so saw this this opening when it was first posted and just um, was really excited to see uh, something where uh, a collaborative team was really focused on the importance of um, ensuring that all students get what they need when they need it. Um, I think of MTSS as, the, as really an equity driven um, system for improving uh, the educational opportunities for our students. And so this felt like a really good fit and I've had some you know, good conversations both with the committee, um, with the forum on Thursday um, and with, uh, with the superintendent and uh, excited about the, the prospect of uh, adding my contributions to the, the work you all are undertaking, so. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea and I'd love to um, talk more and have any of your questions. Thank you. Do we have questions? We have a really quiet bunch tonight apparently. Hmm. Till you well, talk food service. Mid, 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 I'm just well, kidding, I'm just kidding. There's food, we like to eat. Um, right, yeah. Um, and uh, uh, if I may, um, <clears throat> I, I confess that this position, you know, Jamie clearly had a very clear idea in his head what this position was and what he was looking for that was different than what we've had before in a curriculum coordinator. Um, and this MT, I'm still getting my head around MTSS. I mean, I, I think it, the, what I do understand is great, but I don't totally get it yet. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, do you have a clear sense, and, and maybe I missed this in the beginning of your introduction, and forgive me if I did, um, do you have a clear sense of of what he wants you to do? I I think so. I think it will, and I think it will evolve over conversations. The I mean, the thing about uh, you know MTSS it, um, is that it's sort of an um, it's the an evolution of a lot of pieces of the education se sector that uh, you know depending on how long you've been doing this um, you've heard about and talked about for a while and it and it really brings um, more cohesion to it um, it thinks it tries to eliminate an, um, a number of the silos that ha you know have sprung up and always will exist in sort of organizations because you you get sort of expertise and and people go in direction but I, you know it's um it, it connects to the conversation you um you all had earlier around special services and um and students uh who are getting you know special education services and and making sure that we don't continue to operate sort of in these separate silos but is looking at it sort of as an ecosystem for education um and so i have um and that is the the part and I, that's where the equity part fits because it really is thinking about all kids um, and, and ensuring that they are getting the supports they need when they need them. They're not getting more supports than they need because we want to support kids to do the best you know that they can, um, but we're not missing kids either. Um, and really keeping those um, tight, tight cycles of looking at data and talking about it. And so I, that is um, that's a big a big piece of it. Um, but it spans, I think, a lot. Um, a lot of the pieces that may exist um, really well in either in pockets or across schools, um, but brings it into a, um, a much more cohesive um, way of looking at all and having all those pieces kind of talk to each other. Thank you. Lisa, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Lisa, Lisa had her hand up. All right, thank you. Um, could you please tell us a little bit about a project that you have um, worked with teachers to implement and um, whether they originated the idea or you did, how um, that was implemented and how um, you supported teachers in doing that work and um, right through assessment. So what's an exciting project that you've worked on with them? 
Great, thank you. Uh, yes, no, I think, um, I mean, my work uh, with teachers has been, um, I think some of the most rewarding work because I think you really see that the, um, you know, the work get into action very, very quickly. I think the most, the most recent work was designing an instructional framework. So we, in my last district, we set a vision for what we thought great teaching and learning should look like. Um, and we sort of use the descriptors of rigorous and joyful and culturally responsive and then, um, I worked with um, kind of numerous groups of teachers, instructional coaches, um, and you know, uh, sort of our curriculum coordinators at each um, at each curriculum area, each department, to define what each of those terms really meant for us. So even we can sort of throw around the words, but really um, figure out sort of at what level what those words meant, um, and then worked on. And the part that was most actionable around that was worked on a set of. Um, reflective questions that teachers would use when they are planning for instruction to really think about is this, you know, is this individual um, lesson plan, is this unit, um, is it is it rigorous, is it joyful, and is it culturally responsive? Um, and thinking about what kind of questions would you ask yourself, um, especially if you had, if you were thinking, gosh, I, I know that this is like the most fun unit, my kids walk away from it, they're always talking about how fun it is, but is it, does it, does it meet our standards, is it rigorous enough? And just had a set of reflective questions that teachers could ask themselves as they were going through and looking over, you know, that unit that they may have taught for five years, but we're, you know, now questioning the rigor of, or something they know meets all the standards of, of, um, of the certain area, but maybe didn't have as much, you know, joy in it. And so, what kind of questions could they ask? What, you know, when we talk about joy, it means, you know, students have choice and they have ability to collaborate, and, you know, all of those. They're not just, you know, laughing all the time. So there's a, there's a, um, a kind of a really deep definition of joy. So, but all of those questions. I worked with um, with teachers to sort of devise and rework um, and make sure. I mean, I think culture responsive was probably the ones where we had the most deep discussions. Make sure we were really getting at even the earlier discussion you had was it is it an equity um, policy? Is it an anti racism policy? And there's a big difference there. And so looking at our questions in the same sort of way, which which things do we particularly want to call attention to? And those are like the deepest conversations I had with teachers. And then going out and working with them using those questions and said and they said come you know come watch this lesson. I looked at these two questions as I was reframing it um, and this is how it helped and this is where it's still missing and so I think um, that was probably the most recent sort of experience of working really closely with teachers to come up with something that they could use really regularly um, in their in their daily practice to um, help with their own uh, teaching and learning. Thank you. I love that idea of rigorous, joyful, and culturally responsive um, lessons. Thank you. Thanks. Andrea. Yes. Um, I want to. How do you feel about the the job responsibility that says that you will um, take on any responsibilities assigned by the superintendent? Are you okay with that? Uh, that that is a great question. Um, I think I have often had that in my job description. Um, I have never found it to be uh, something that I got was abused or un, or, or anything I got that came out of the blue. Um, so I, I had not double a question that at all. Um, I think it's, you know, I think it's important. I think the, the, the job of the superintendent is, you know, incredibly uh, uh, challenging um, and to have, you know, someone that, you know, can, can be um, a partner in that, in that work and be uh, a helpful support in, in, in different parts. I think that's where I think that, the, that, that line comes from that um, there may be a meeting that needs help. There may be, you know, a scope of work. Um, so that's, that, that was the um, sort of the, uh, the spirit with which I took the, the the that bullet point in the job description. Okay, I that's an important part of this job, and um, as long as you're ready for it, I think that's important. Okay. <laughs> More questions, guys. I think that everybody's quiet now, so Jane, <laughs> thank you for coming and talking to us. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Anda, the, the board and I are going to head to, into executive session, but we will. I will be in touch with you later this evening. Sounds great. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you.
All right, guys. So I need someone to make the motion. I make the motion to help me with it, Jamie, <laughs> to <laughs> empower the superintendent to um, hire a Andra Adams um, and negotiate a sa salary and two-year agreement. Is that what you wanted? <laughs> that's good. pretty good. I think seconded. that's fine. Okay. All right, and that's seconded. All right, so. To enter into negotiations, sorry, I'm picking minutes. To enter into negotiations, is that? Or just to hire her pending successful negotiations? Yeah, hire her pending successful okay. negotiations. That's fine. All right, any discussion? All right. So I'm going to call for the vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any nays? All, the, all right, the vote has Thank gone. you all very much. It's a really exciting night, I think, for WRVSU. Um, Jamie, did you have another executive? Yeah, for personnel, it'll be brief. Okay. I move to go into uh, executive session for personnel reasons. Second. At 8.08. Okay. Uh, the recording stopped. All right. Anything else tonight, Jamie? Uh, just no action taken. We're no back in taken. session at 817. Yeah. Yep. With no action taken. Yeah. All right. I guess we uh, that's, a that's all I've got for tonight. Just to check the future agenda items. Um, we're going to definitely get you those clear numbers. And what I was going to propose is that we would actually show you what is the budgeting around food service look like if we keep it status quo versus if we move to the SU. I think that that will give you excuse me, uh, you know, real clear comps to work from. Um, so we'll have that for you guys coming up at local districts and then at the SU meeting. And then also the energy committee will be on for discussion and possible action. Um, and then of course you get data reports next month in the audit as well. So you'll get your SUY data reports and we'd look to adopt the, uh, the audit. Jamie, has there been any, um, do we have anything set up for uh, support staff negotiations? I'm awaiting for them to initiate. Um, and we've been so busy. I haven't looked for us to initiate. My plan would be that we kick that out in March. So I was going to reach out to the negotiations committee and start to get some dates from you guys. Okay. I, I expect that they're going to send me a letter after break. That's what we had tentatively discussed. Is there a date in the statute that they have to send it to you by? I don't think so. New Hampshire, Maybe. like September. I don't know that one off the top of my head. If there is, yeah. All right, guys. I'm uh, a motion to adjourn. And, oh. and one more, one more topic, Kathy. Just a second, please. Sure. Given, given our. Given our disparity of how we're operating for town meetings, are we going to have an issue with reorganization? Or are we just going to, how are we going to do no, that? No, I mean, we would wait like we did last year and reorganize once everyone, every district is completed. That's what we did last summer. My sense is we would do the same this summer. Okay. So my sense is that reorg meeting, based on when you guys are tentatively discussing warning your meetings, would be in June. Right, we would reorg in June. As always, our side is ahead of the curve. <laughs> well, hopefully, we will um, have all budgets passed in May, right? We won't have to go back and re vote yeah. until. That's the goal. <laughs> easy. All right. All right. Oh, guys. It's easy. All right. Uh, I'd, I'd move to adjourn at 8 19. Second it. Oh. All right, guys. Good night. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Bye. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you.